Good morning. Good morning. My name is Ignacio Ramirez. I'll be your moderator for this morning's session. Welcome to Archetype Pattern Workshop. This is a school and it is not a church. And neither we affiliated with a church or religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non-denominational, religious, and scientific research organization dedicated to proving the existence of Yahweh or Elohim and the operation of the eternal pattern, purpose, and plan operating throughout eternity unto this present day. Now this school is the result of a divine panoramic vision and revelation given to Henry Clifford Kenley in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. And we have established private schools throughout the United States, Canada, and certain other foreign countries. Our type pattern workshop was established in May of February of 2021. Now, in this school, we use and teach by the true and the original names and titles for the Heavenly Father, the Word of Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name for the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted by Lord. The true title for the Word or Son is Elohim. It also been improperly substituted by God. And the true name for the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Lord and God, they are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul filled with the Holy Spirit tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and God's many. We don't know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. This means Elohim is a title that our Creator chose for Himself. Jesus is a name, but Jesus is an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part into a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any characters or letters in their alphabet that would produce the sound made by this letter J. Neither was there a letter J in the English language until some 1400 years after the death of the Messiah. Therefore, such names as Jesus and Jehovah are impossible renderings for the true and original name of our Heavenly Father and His Son. Now Christ is a title, just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this state He is incomprehensible, inscrutable, and indiscernible. He is the ultimate source substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh symbolized in his pure spirit state on this chart as a cloud. Now Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. We have drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on this chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in this pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right with himself as Elohim. This is the Word or Son, a super incorporeal being, that is, having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. Now this shape and form can only be seen in a divine vision and understood in a divine revelation. Later on, this self-same spirit manifests himself in a physical body and walks the earth plane as Yahshua the Messiah. The world calls him Jesus Christ. Now there's only one name given unto salvation and we all must know this name. So the simple, Yet, the intelligent question we should ask ourselves is, what was the name of the Savior during the time that he walked the earth plane? 
A further understanding of this name and title could be had by reading the preface of the Holy Name Bible. Also in this school, we teach on the divine pattern of the universe. It is called a divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. Now after Yahweh led the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, he called Moses on top of Mount Sinai and showed him a tabernacle pattern in a vision. And he instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. This pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court round about. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. And we go forth in this school to prove that everything in the universe moves and operates according to the structure and function of this threefold tabernacle pattern and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. Now the 10 primary constitutional objectives or aims of the school are as follows. One is to help you find and know Yahweh or Elohim as he really is and as he actually exists. Two is to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah. Without the distinction of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third is to investigate the unexplained spirit law, or so-called law of nature, and the powers latent in man. Fourth is to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, modern, practical, and occult science. Fifth is to extirpate current superstitions, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth is to learn know and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensation and ages. And seventh is to deserve and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the devil, the serpent, the dragon, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensation of time. And eighth is to earnestly contend for the common salvation of faith that was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. And ninth is to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained. There is no other name given among men whereby man must be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And tenth is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the newer state. Our watchword is peace. Our slogan is speak the truth. To the, uh, this morning we have prayer by Dr. Joseph Iams. Our scripture lesson is Revelations, the 17th chapter. Our scripture will be Dr. Annette Ramirez. And we have a selection of music after the prayer. Morning, everyone. Moment of prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father Yahweh Elohim, to allow us to be here one more time to learn about the purpose, pattern, and plan, so that we can, uh, we can, so that we can go, go, go home pretty soon, since uh, we are at the end of this age. We ask all these blessings, and not only because it's not the Son's name, or, uh, or Yeshua the Messiah. Let us all say.
Good morning, class. Good morning. I'll be reading out of the Holy Name version, containing the Holy Name version, uh, containing the Holy Name versions of the Old and New Testaments, critically compared with ancient authorities and various manuscripts, revised by the late A.B. Trainer, the Scripture Research Association. I'll be reading Revelations, the 17th chapter. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the sons and with the blood of the martyrs of Yahweh, Yahshua. And when I saw her, I wondered with great astonishment. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore art thou astonished? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the abyss and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose name were, were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was, and is not, and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kingdoms, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when it cometh, it must continue a short space. And the beast that was, and is not, even he, is the eighth head, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings, one hour with the beast. These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them, for he is a mighty ruler of kings, and they are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest were a where the horse sitteth are peoples, and multitudes, and nations, and tongues, and the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. For Yahweh hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree, and give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of Yahweh shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city, which reigneth over the kings of the earth. I have read Revelation, the 17th chapter. Let us all say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Again, and those that are out there in, in YouTube and Facebook land, we welcome you, and I hope one of these days come and visit. Uh, before I call the, the next speaker, uh, I'd like to, for Will, to come, and the reason why I'm picking Will, because some of these 
I'm going to have to read something. We've been going over this the Apostolic Fathers thing, and I went and did some uh, investigation and research, and I found this thing online. It talks about, see, a regular Christian out there doesn't even know where his religion comes from, where it starts, where it began. We could say, in coming into this teaching, that Dr. Kelly received in 1931 and was given this pattern that been all the time in the Bible back here with Moses we could see and these charts that he had drawn up pictorially we could see the purpose of Yahweh operating right. from the beginning out to the end I'm going to take that chart now and we've been studying about this. And in this teaching, we learn, we, we, we investigate where these religions come from, where they started, where they got their beginning. So we go and do research, and you know, some of the stuff is kind of slanted towards the Roman Catholic Church, because they're the ones that imprimatted a lot of the, the writings and the scriptures and stuff, you know. And they, did, they compiled some uh, facts and things, but also they even say that the stuff that they, they, they put out, they have no foundation for it, in other words. But I'm going to have him go through this thing, and then he could go into a discourse, all right? So if you will, will, because some of these, these words are kind of tongue-tied, you know? Oh, okay, go ahead. All right. Okay, uh, I'm gonna read this. I'm, I'm oh, you know, no, no, I'm, I'm good. Oh, okay. I think it could it could pick up. All right, the Apostolic Fathers. The Apostolic Fathers consist of persons and documents that interpreted and applied the Apostolic message in the first Apostolic generation. Uh, reference Olson, the Story of Christian Theology, page 41. They were acknowledged as leaders in the early church because of their close connections with the apostles. For example, Peter, Paul, John, etc. Thus, they provide a link between the apostles who knew Jesus and the later generation of Christian apologists and defenders of Christian orthodoxy. Uh, multimedia, introducing the Apostolic Fathers, two lectures by Mike Reeves. Common list of Apostolic Fathers. The list of fathers included under this section varies. Agreed on by all church historians are Clement, Ignatius, Polycarp, the Didache, that, it, that means the teaching of the Twelve Apostles, Epistle of Barnabas, and Shepherd of Hermas. It is important to note that most church historians actually call certain documents, for example, the, the Didache, Church Fathers. Others find their way to this list, such as the so-called Second Letter of Clement, the martyrdom of Polycarp, the epistle of Dionysius, of Di uh, Di oh boy, Diognetus, and fragment writings by Papias. That is, re the reference is Olson, page 41. The article will focus on all those accepted by all. The first one is Clement of Rome, the third successor to Peter as Bishop of Rome, had seen the blessed apostles, Peter and Paul, and had been conversant with them. The reference is Irenaeus, and his book is Adverses Essays 3. Uh, the second one is Ignatius of Antioch, was the second successor of Peter in the Sea of Antioch. See, uh, references Eusebius, Historical Ecclesiastes the, the third. And during his life in the center of Christian activity, he may have met with others of the apostolic band and accepted tradition substantiated by the similarity of Ignatius' thought with the ideas of the Johannine writings, declares that he was a disciple of the Apostle John. Polycarp was instructed by the Apostles, uh, references Irenaeus, and had been a disciple of John, and the reference is Eusebius, whose contemporary he was for nearly 20 years. He later trained Irenaeus as a disciple, thus giving Irenaeus teachings great reliability and authority. The Didache, the, di the Didache, 
also known as the teaching of the Lord to the Gentiles by the Twelve Apostles, or the teaching of the Twelve Apostles, is basically a handbook or manual of Christian ethical instructions and church order. Uh, references Holmes, and his book is Dictionary of the Latter New Testaments and its Developments, page 301. Okay, that's about you know, a, a rundown. I, I, I was searching through there, and this seems to be the most uh, informative that I could find at the time. That's why I had it read, because we've been going over this for a couple of weeks. And the thing about it, the adversary got the world. He got it through Christianity. Where did Christianity come from? We have this chart right here. First pagan, then Papa Rome. Okay, that's the thing they said about Peter being in Rome, being the first bishop, that's wrong. See, we could correct all that stuff. Okay, Peter was never in Rome. You know? And all this, if you notice, is Greek. Okay, so they're out preaching, preaching to the world. Okay, they're preaching to uh, uh, the non-Jews. Okay, and then instituting those things that were fulfilled by Yahshua the Messiah. They call it uh, Reformation. You know, instituting all this stuff. Actually. They got them calling Joshua the side a liar to his face when you do these things, okay? So it's just a little a, a deal of, uh, you know, we do our research, we go, when we hear things, well, go check it out. Look for yourself. And those that are in Christianity, do your research too. See what you're into, where it came from, okay? We know, okay. Uh, okay, I'm gonna call our, our first speaker. It'll be Dr. Will Williams. And thank you for reading that. You can give him a, an applause right All right, thank you. I appreciate the first speaker. And, and, good, and good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Glad to see you here. Glad to whoever's watching online, we welcome you to join us and to study this great and awesome, you know, profound, colossal, stupendous panoramic vision and revelation given to us by Yahweh our Lamb. And before I start off, I want to commend Iggy, because he got these charts here, you know, he thought, you know, he got these made, the Daniel chart, the Asian dispensation chart. He's been doing a great job. So we, if you've been noticing, We've been filling the room up, with, you know, with these bigger charts, you know. So pretty soon we'll have the 40 plate up and all, and so so that you can see this in full living color, right? Okay. Um, yeah, you want to take this down? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because I could probably I could probably use the the schematology chart, and this will be on a. He said that he's got a plate for this, so we'll have a stand for this on his own. You know. You're backwards. You know, I got it. So yeah, I appreciate what the first speaker had to say, and uh, and, and it's kind of like what we had been kind of going through a little bit in the last few sessions. Well, the last one we kind of got into it. The sessions before that, we were studying the doctrine of uh, Clarence Larkin, which is really one of the foundations of Protestant Christianity, okay? And uh, the scripture lesson we had read, and so, boy, why do I have to juggle when I get up? <laughs> but it's okay, because you, you're never going to get it all in two hours. That's just an impossibility. Even Dr. Kelly, the man who received this vision, remember, she couldn't express in two hours, so he would so he set up a school and he would tell you to come back so that you can come and learn and see, you know, what this is about. Okay? Now, where to begin? Because after what the first speaker uh, we had the scripture lesson. Um, 
God, where do I begin this? Let's, well, since we're in Revelation, let's go to Revelation's uh, 12th chapter. Let's try that. Maybe I can introduce it from there, and, and, and maybe we can kind of come down a little bit. Hopefully, maybe I can give a big overview. And I want to use this chart, since we got it up here, you know, big living color. You know, may as well use it. Um, so there's, I want where there's a war in heaven. You and the Holy Name was at 12 and... King James is 7. 7 or 8. What year are you reading? Yes, 12 and 8. Mm -hmm. And there was war in heaven. Mm -hmm. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels. Mm -hmm. And prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. Mm -hmm. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Okay, so now here we have here, this is the first stage, the creative age. Here we have the angelic creation. And we have a dotted line here, and we have the physical creation. Now at this point, the angelic creation was the only thing that's happening. The physical creation had not yet been created. It was void. It's thrown out into the abyss. All right, this dotted line shows you that there's a connection right. between the two. Okay? So now, when there was war in heaven, what Satan did was simply set up a government of his own. Okay? He set up a government, and, and it lasted for about an hour. Okay, and there was war. That war lasted for about an hour. As soon as he set up the government, there was war. All right, it lasted about an hour. Michael and his angels cast out Satan and his host. Did you finish reading that? Yes, and do you want me to continue? Well, yeah, what does it say? And I heard a loud voice saying. Yeah, that's what I want to hear. Okay. 11. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength. Mm hmm. And the kingdom of our Eloah, mm -hmm. and the power of his Messiah. Okay, now the power of his Messiah. We keep reading. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our Eloah day and night. Mm -hmm. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, ah. and by the word of their testimony. Now, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. What Lamb? This Lamb. Because see, this Lamb took on shape and formed him out Elohim, Yahweh who is pure spirit. See, Yahweh is pure spirit. And comprehensible and inscrutable. These attributes is what he is. That's, it's not what he possesses, it's what he is. These attributes took on shape and form in part, not in totality, into this shape and form. This is Elohim, which is a divine title meaning the Almighty, Yahweh Elohim or correctly. And this is the original or the archetype pattern of the universe. This is also the lamb slain before the foundation of the world because when he took on shape and form, coming down into a lesser state of pure spirit, that constitutes a death. See, this is the lamb slain before the, before anything came about. Your salvation was already reckoned just by the fact that he took on shape and form. Right. That's a death. Then this is the word of son. This word of son became flesh and dwelt among us. And then we beheld his glory. See, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So you had two manifestations of the one spirit. Now in heaven, see, Satan was an angel. He was an anointed angel, if I put it like that. Let's get uh, Isaiah 14 and 12. Maybe we'll just go around the board. If I can try to lay this out, and then hopefully I can get to a particular point of where I want to get to. But I have to lay some sort of a foundation or an introduction at least. Okay, Isaiah 14 and 12. Mm How -hmm. art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, mm -hmm. son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, mm -hmm. which didst weaken the nations? Mm -hmm. For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven, and I will exalt my throne above the stars of El. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Mm -hmm. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. 
I will be like the Most High. Okay, so I'm going to be like the Most High. See, it's, here he is, he's on the veil. And he says, I'm going to be above the, the clouds. See, I sits here on the Ark of the Covenant. So I'm going to be above that. See, I will be like the Most High. See, but he's the, we'll get to that. But he's the angel that covereth. But we'll, we'll get to that. But keep reading. Yet thou shalt be brought down to the grave, mm -hmm. to the sides of the pit. Mm -hmm. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee mm -hmm. and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that maketh the earth to tremble, mm -hmm. did, that did shake the kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness, and destroyed the cities thereof, yeah. that opened not the house of his prisoners? I also need to die here, please. All the kings. That's of good the enough. Okay, good enough. All right, now. Oh. <laughs> <a> big boy. <laughs> if you would just hang that right up there, please. Yeah, pull it down. Pull it down. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, oh, no, I need a clamp for this one. I need a clamp. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, that's fine. Yeah, because I need the, the guy here, this part. Okay, thank you, sir. All right. Now, you get read that about the war in heaven. All right? And, and Michael and his angels cast them out, and they're not out here at this point. They're immersed in ethereal darkness around the, the unfinished earth. See, there's this, it's, the void is null, it's, you know, null and void, you know, all right, darkness on the face of the deep. Again, he set up a government up here, that government was cast out. And he's down here seeking whom he may devour. Now I want you to go to Ezekiel 28 and 11. You see, now Elohim here, see this is, the original or the archetype pattern of the universe. This is the word of son. See, when he came out, when he took on shape and form here, he had to come from behind the cloud. The cloud is inscrutable and it's incomprehensible. So he'll, in this analogy, he has to come through that veil, coming through the veil to take on shape and form. See, and as I said, by him taking on shape and form, that's a death. This constitutes the first Passover. Right. right. Okay? See, the Passover that we studied is here on this migratory trip. Matter of fact, get uh, Hebrews 8 and 1. See, this migratory trek. See, Egypt, wilderness of Sinai, Canaan's land represents the greater and more perfect sanctuary, which is the universe. See, and that's the universe that Yahweh pitched. Or the tabernacle that he did. Yes, go ahead and read it, you guys. Hebrews 8, yes, I want to I'm sorry, see, I want Hebrews first. I want to get, get that before okay. we get into that. Hebrews 8 and 1. Not of the things which we have spoken, mm -hmm. this is a son. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which Yahweh pitch and not man. Now, see. Elohim is the true tabernacle that Yahweh pitched and not the man. And that is the universe. That's, that's represented here on this migratory trek. Egypt, wilderness of Sinai, Canaan's land, which is like the tabernacle that we have in court roundabout, holy place, most holy place. Here, the tabernacle, the migratory pattern. The comparison between the two is what you need to know and understand as far as the principles that Yahweh is laying out. Once you understand the principles between these two plates, then you can go through all of these plates. Right. It's your key to understanding what's on these charts. Okay, It's the key to understanding the purpose of Yahweh in operation. Because without understanding the pattern, then you're not going to understand the purpose or the plan behind it. You have to, which is what he is. See, he himself is a universal spirit pattern with a universal spirit law embedded therein by which everything is controlled by, okay? 
Now, he is the only begotten son of Yahweh, whereas everything else is created, like, for example, the man Adam. Now, the man Adam is the earthly created son of Yahweh, but not the begotten. He's just in the flesh. Satan is an angel. He's a created angel. See, look, we have the angelic creation and a physical creation. Here's the sun. The sun shines. Here you got uh, is there any race over there? I was never an artist, which is why I got into photography and videos. <laughs> I know it's a sick looking tree, but just pretend it's a tree, okay? Now you can see this guy, this is a human being, I hope, right? It's a man. Does look like a man, stick man, right? Okay, good enough. All right, now the sun shines, and here we are. We got the man, which we'll say is representative of the animal kingdom. And we have the tree here, we'll say it's representative of the plant kingdom. All right? Now, the plants take the sunshine and they use the sunshine to create chlorophyll, which is their food, right? All right? And so they need, they, they need carbon dioxide along with that, and, uh, which we get, which we get from, from man, because man exhales right. CO2. CO2, carbon dioxide. The plants can use the carbon dioxide. Actually, what the plant does, it doesn't need the whole compound. All it needs is the carbon part. It takes the carbon part along with the sun to create chlorophyll through photosynthesis and create chlorophyll. Now the waste product that is made from this is O2. Because it doesn't need that, it just needs the carbon. So the waste body said, but guess what? We'll take it. We'll take that O2 and we'll take it, use it, and then the waste product for us is the carbon dioxide, which the plants can use. So you see there's a symbiotic relationship between the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom. Why? Because there's a symbiotic relationship between the angelic creation and the physical creation. That's why there's a dotted line here. See, case in point, when you go to sleep at night, you dream. When you dream, you don't dream physical. You dream incorporeal. In other words, you, see, you went to bed, you was in the physical state, but when you went to bed in your mind, you crossed over into the angelic realm, in the incorporeal realm, because you're dreaming. See? And the man, because look, you're created body, soul, spirit. See, your soul is incorporeal. Your soul is incorporeal like this. The only difference between you and an angel is you're encumbered in the flesh. But you can astral project. Your soul can astral project itself out. That's a common thing that we humans do. It's astral projection. You know, we do that. Is it because that's what happened here? See, at the burning bush with Moses. See, when Moses was talking to this angel in the burning bush, see, he didn't see, see, I was Joshua's son of Nun. That was this man down here, Joshua's son of Nun, astral projecting. Out here to talk to the burning bush. That's why he could tell Moses, he said, because Moses was commissioned, and Moses said, well, look, I'm, a, I'm, I'm slow of speech, you know? And he said, well, and the, 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 the angel said, well, isn't Aaron your brother? Good speaker? He said, yeah. How do you know? Because I'm talking to him right now. That's how I know he's your brother. And he's, and he's going to come out here to, to meet you. Just as I'm talking to you about him, I'm down here talking to him about you. <laughs> See? I got a question. Yes, sir. Okay, well, when we're dreaming, we're in that state. Is that a state of consciousness that we're in? Yes. Okay, that's all. You're not losing consciousness. You're just... Your physical body has said that you, 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 it's, your, it's, it's a way for your physical body to regenerate itself. 
and sleep, but your conscience is still going because, see, look, your physical body is a, how can I put it, is a, it's a sensory magnet. You know, you may not be conscious of it, but it, but your body records everything that happens. Every, you know, every touch, like the wind blows on you, every touch, everything your eyes see, you may not pay attention to it, but, you're, but it's registered. Every smell you make, every taste you have, it's all information. So when you go to sleep at night, all that stuff has to be processed and downloaded and compartmentalized, so to speak. That's the process. It has to go through all of that. You know, some information, it'll, it'll look at it and say, eh, it's not important, I'll throw it away. Other parts of information, oh, maybe I'll, I'll keep that, I might need it later. Your, that's what your body does. Your body is an information magnet on, its, on the five sensory level. Because it senses everything. It records everything. I remember once I was in a science class in school, and they, they, they were showing something about a guy that had an operation. And they used an oscilloscope and they connected to his nerve and they was able to tap, literally tap into this guy's memories of what he was saying. You know, I mean, the, his voice coming through the speaker from a memory from, the, from his cells. So, you know, that's, you know, your body remembers these things. You know, even like, you know, like if you're a musician or, or a trainer or a boxer, you know, you have muscle memory that remembers stuff, you know. Even today, I used to take piano lessons, but my fingers, to a certain extent, still kind of remembers, you know, when I used to take lessons and stuff, the muscle memory of it. You know, and, and, and you can train your body like that. Your body is, you know, from a physical level, is, you know, is trainable like that. That's why, you know, people that do what, they, what we would call extraordinary things, it took them years of concentration and practice and training to get to that particular level, okay? Uh, where were we at? Ezekiel. Ezekiel 28 and 11. Uh -huh. Moreover, the word of Yahweh came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, mm -hmm. and say unto him, Thus saith Yahweh, mm -hmm. Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Mm -hmm. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of Elohim. I said, I said you were in Eden here. You were in Eden, the garden of Elohim. Continue. Every precious stone was thy covering. Now it says, every precious stone was thy covering. Now what, what stone is that? See, look, remember, everything is created in the image and likeness of Elohim, bar nothing. And that includes the satanic spirit, because he's not a free moral agent that some people might think. He is controlled by the law of the spirit like everything else in this universe. See, now here we got Elohim here. So as we were telling you, he had to come out from, from the pure spirit state, take on shape and form. This constitutes the first Passover. What do you mean? He's passing over from pure spirit into super incorporalization, taking on shape and form. And as we said, that's a death. Okay? Now here's Satan. He said, I will be like the Most High. And we're going to show you. Read. Every precious stone was thy covering. Every precious stone was thy covering. What stone? See, that would, that would be like the attributes here. All right? What attributes might they be? Read. The sardis. Wisdom. Topaz. Intelligence. And the diamond. Knowledge. The barrel. Beauty. The onyx. Love. And the jasper. Justice. The sapphire. Foundation. The emerald. Power. And the carbon. Strength. And gold. Kingdom. <laughs> the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Read. Thou art the anointed cherub that covers. Now he's the anointed cherub that covers. Why? Here on the veil of this tabernacle. See, there's seven steps here. The sixth step is the second departmental veil, a blue, purple, scarlet with angels embroidered on it. He's embroidered on the veil like everybody else. He says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covered this veil, covered the most holy place of this tabernacle. You could not, you could come in here. This is an open court. You go, this is the first step, the gate. The second step is the altar of sin and sacrifice with the four horns, blood on the four horns. Third step is the brazen labor. And this was an open court. See, a court roundabout that was open. 
The fourth step is the door, which the cup of holy anointing always was placed at upon you at the door. The fourth step. The fifth, then you go through the door. The fifth step was this whole holy place of the lampstand. Golden, let's see, these were made of brass. Right. These were made of gold. Golden table, golden lampstand, golden table of shoe bread with the 12 loaves on it. Golden altar of incense. See, the fifth, whole fifth step. Principles, light, bread, intercession. Okay? The sixth step is this second departmental veil, the blue, purple, and scarlet, which is also called the veil of the flesh. Now, he's on the veil, and he's on the veil that covered it. Remember in Isaiah, he said, I will ascend above the cloud. So he could do that because this veil, see, surrounded the whole room of this most holy place. It was in the front, the sides, the back, the ceiling. Right, right. See, and, and Satan, as far as an angel was concerned, he was an angel of the first magnitude, meaning he was the brightest of them all. See, Because, see, if stars, stars are a type of angels, in astronomy, you measure a star's brightness by the magnitude. It's for, it's, if it's the brightest star out there, we would say, oh, this is the brightest star out there, so we'll say this is a star of the first magnitude. Well, this star is not as bright. It's bright, but not as bright as this one, so we'll say it's a star of the second magnitude, and so forth and so on. Satan was, or Lucifer, was an angel of the first magnitude. He was the brightest and the smartest. The most malevolent. He could sing. He could rap. He could talk. All of that. He could say, you know, he had a timbre, timbre. He could play. He was just, I mean, he was just multi-talented. You know? He was Prince before Prince was Prince. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm not put Prince down there. But I, I say that because Prince was a very talented guy. The guy could play like 20 instruments proficiently. Okay, you know, that kind of thing, you know. Um, keep reading. And I have set thee so. Yahweh set him like that. It wasn't an accident. Yahweh set him that way. He's, he made him that way because he's part of the purpose too. In fact, I'll go as far as to say this. Satan is not a liability in the purpose of Yahweh. In fact, he is an asset. Right. He's an asset. You know, he's part of the purpose like everything else. And he's an asset to the purpose. In what way? For us to look at so we can see the difference between the mystery of righteousness and the mystery of iniquity. Okay, keep reading. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of Elohim. Mm -hmm. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Now the stones of fire are the angels. The seventh step here is the Ark of the Covenant. I should have mentioned that. Where the cloud and the Israelites are set on. Inside they had the second tables of stone. Uh, Aaron's rod that budded in a pot of manna. And this represents the seat of authority. See, for the Israelites when they were in the wilderness, okay? Now, uh, keep reading. Thou was perfect in thy ways mm -hmm. from the day that thou was created, mm -hmm. till iniquity was found in thee. To keep reading. By the multitude of thy merchandise, mm -hmm. they have filled the midst of thee with violence. See, with violence. It was violent. He was a violent man. And, and lies. The, his merchandise. What merchandise? The merchandise of lies. Saying, oh, you know, because he looked around and said, well, I don't see anybody more beautiful than I am. I don't see anybody around here wiser than I am. You know? I don't see anybody here brighter than I am. So, I'm, oh, angelic creation, your salvation has arrived. See? And what could they say? See? Now, I could get into it a little more, but I'm trying to do an overview. Actually, the, the thing was, one third of the angels were already predisposed right. towards him anyway. And Yahweh simply gave them. He gave them a, he, he gave them a, a leader after their own heart. He gave them Satan. He said, well, how do you know that? I can go back here and look at the scripture. See, Isaiah 8 and 20 says this. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, then there's no light in them. You have to go back and use the scriptures to justify and verify the things that are up here on this chart, these charts, because what you're looking at is the illustrations of the Bible. See, King Saul was up here. And King Saul was the first king, Saul, uh, Saul uh, uh, from the tribe of Benjamin. 
He was the first king, and, and he was a, and his rule was a satanic rule. But he was anointed by Yahweh to be like that. See, the people demanded a king when, when prior to that they were ruled by the judges, the book of Judges. See, there were see when you understand. See, this is why we try to tell people to understand the story of the migratory trip of how. Abraham was up here, he received a promise and he was told his seed had to go down to a land they knew not and be evilly treated for 400 years, but they would come out with great substance. All right? They came out, they were 40 years in the wilderness, and then, they came, and then Moses died, jo Joshua took over. 603,550 that came up out of here died, see, but it was a new birth. See, of 144,000 that came across with Joshua, and that's what was, and that was the fighting men. And then from, the, from after the death of Joshua until Saul, they were ruled for 450 years by the judges. There were 15 judges. You read about them in the book of Judges. Right. One of the, the, the most famous judge everybody knows about is Samson. He was, the, he was the 13th judge, I believe. He was the most famous of them all. Other than Samuel. Samuel was a judge. He was the 15th judge. He was the last judge prior to them receiving their first king. And he was the one that told them, because they came to him and said, we want a king. And they said, y'all don't want to do that. <laughs> you don't want to do that. Yahweh is your king. But see, but he had treated Yahweh. He said, look, I understand what they're doing. They rejected me, but that's okay. I'm going to give them what they want. I'm going to give them a king after their own heart. And he did. He gave them Saul. And it was a satanic rule. Okay, and see, he ruled for 40 years. That's why I can say that, in, that when we read about the war in heaven, right. see, prophetic time, see, one hour in prophetic time is 40 years. So that's why I can say that the war in heaven lasted about an hour with Michael and Gabriel, when, he set, when Satan set up his kingdom. See, because I, look at, I can see the type of shadow. That's the point I'm making. Okay, keep reading. And thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of Elohim, mm -hmm. and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, mm -hmm. from the midst of the stones of fire. Mm -hmm. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thy hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Mm -hmm. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings, and they may behold thee. Mm -hmm. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thy iniquities. By the multitude of your iniquities, of, of his lies. You, I sell a lie, you buy it. <laughs> That's pretty much it. Continue. By the iniquity of thy traffic, uh -huh. therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. See, traffic. See, people think you're talking about a busy intersection. No, traffic is like buying and selling, you know, moving goods and merchandise. You know, we'll get to that in a minute. Keep reading. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth mm -hmm. in the sight of all them that behold thee. Mm -hmm. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Mm -hmm. Thou shalt be a, a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. All right, but now, here he is, he's cast out here, and he's here the unformed earth, and he's seeking whom he may devour, and he's looking at the creation. When Yahweh started making the, cre the creation, Satan is out here. And he didn't do anything until, until the man was created. And even when the man was created, as long as the woman was in him, he didn't do nothing. But then when the, when the man was told to lay down, you know, go into a deep sleep, and, a, and, a, and an incision was made where the womb and the bone was taken, and the rib was taken out, and, and Elohim brought to him a womb man, then you see Satan coming up in here. He's, that's when he comes on the scene. See, that's, that's when he comes on the scene. See, because, and he went, and notice, he went to the woman. He didn't go to the man. See, just like in heaven, he went to the angels. He didn't, he didn't go to Elohim. He went to the angels, <laughs> to the bride. See, you know, trying to, you know, say, oh, well, you, are, you know, it's like some, you know, you see a woman out there all alone, and they go, hey, baby, you out here all alone, what's up? What you doing? <laughs> you know, want to go for a ride? So, <laughs> so see, he came to, he, he approached her, all right? Now, what happened here, I'm just going, you know, her, she, she, he tricked her into, you know, disobeying the commandment, 
by telling her that she would become something she already was. See, that's how I tricked her, see. And see, and, and, and here's another thing people don't think about. When she was taken out of the man, it made her subject to vanity. Let's read that. Romans 8 and 20, I think. Romans 8 and 20. Mm -hmm. For the creation... Actually, it should be the creature. creature. It should be the, the creature. See? For the creature was made subject to vanity. Uh -huh. Not willingly. Now, listen carefully to what she's reading. Not willingly. She had nothing to do, talking about woman, Eve, she had nothing to do with the, with, with, with Elliot making the man lay down and taking the rib and the womb out and creating. She had nothing to do with that. Not willingly. But we. But by reason of him who had subjected the same in hope. You see, in other words, by, but by reason of him who subjected the same in hope. What do you mean? After she was, after, look, she was tempted by the adversary, and then she broke, you know, she, you know, she picked the, the fruit and offered it to her husband. He's sitting here watching this. He's, he, he doesn't see Satan, but he does see her looking at this tree. <laughs> right? And so he's like, oh, no, baby, you don't do this. But then when she did, he, he took responsibility for her. And when she gave him the fruit, it wasn't like, oh, no, no, baby, I'm good. It wasn't nothing like that. He just... Said, you know, not my will, but thy will be done. And he took the fruit and he ate it and took responsibility for her. But, but also by the same, when, after Elohim came to them, she was made subject to her husband. See, when he got kicked out of the garden, she followed him. Right. He didn't, she didn't get kicked out. He got kicked out. But she followed him because she was made subject to him in hope. Why? Because he's going to point out to this Adam. This Adam points to this second Adam. The real subject in hope. She was made subject to him in hope. Keep reading that. For because the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption. It shall be delivered. See how? By Joshua's death, burial, resurrection. Be delivered from that bondage because through this, the whole human race suffered. The whole human race died because of the first Adam. We were all in his loins. See, we were, before this transmission, you know, we were we were righteous in Adam before we became unrighteous in Adam. Because when he when Adam died, that death passed through all the human race. So in Adam we all died, but in Yahshua, the second Adam, who is the Redeemer, we all lived. Because he was the one that removed it this Adamic transgression. This is the way Dr. Kennedy used to say it. Uh, this is the generator. This is the generator, the man Adam here. See, the man Adam, that would be, this is the degenerator. And then here's Joshua coming along with his death, burial, resurrection, that would make him the regenerator. See, that's why it says here, Degeneration in first half. See? See? And because of that, see, Lucifer, this is the same one, remember, who got kicked out of heaven. Right. And he was waiting. So now, here he is. He's been waiting. Now he even got up in here. All right? Now, the human race. Because, see, the relationship that... Let me come up back over here. Because they're facing each other. See, you can even say this was like a type of an intercourse here. You know, not, you know, not physical, but she entertained him. Right. And see, and the result was that was Cain, because Cain had the mindset, all right? Now, mind you, Cain is the physical son of Adam. I mean, if we were on the Maury show, he would tell, you know, you know, and, you know, Cain, you know, you know, is Adam the father? He would tell Adam, Adam, you are the father, you know, <laughs> you know physically. But spiritually, talking about Cain, his mind, See, it was of the adversary. See, and he built a kingdom. See, the city of Enoch. See, we got it right here. Cain, city of Enoch. And this city was the capital of the earth in what we call the ante diluvian age. See, when the Garden of Eden here, when the transgression happened here, see, this 
set off this first dispensation, the Adamic dispensation. A dispensation can open and close an age. So what happened here closed this age. Come over here. It's illustrated. This is the creative age where we saw it. This is the creative age here prior to the transgression. But once the transgression happened, the sun, which is in the midst of the sky, it began to go down. Sunset to reflect the sun setting in the, in the consciousness of Adam. So they're walking out of the Garden of Eden, or they're walking out of the creative age and walking into the antediluvian age, and which began in darkness because the sun just set. See, that closed out an age, but it opened another age. See? Okay? And so that's and so now here's Cain. And see in the pot and Eve, who was known as the mother of all living, they populated the earth. And Cain, who killed his brother Abel, and Yahweh put a mark on him. Okay? And see, and, and, and Yahweh said, you know, if anybody touched you, you know, you also have to answer to me. Why? Because Cain was his anointed. Just like Lucifer was his anointed. See, according to the purpose. Cain built the city. Alright? And, and ruled that and ruled that earth. His, his family it was a dynastic rule. His family ruled that earth until Noah come along. And see, when Noah come along, see, that's when he talked about the flood, the great deluge. See, that, that's the Noahic dispensation, which closed that age and opened the post-diluvian age, or the age after the flood, because diluvian means flood. And see, so then 101 years after the flood, that's when you have, we got here, the Tower of Babel with Nimrod. Also on the chart here, Dr. Kelly wrote it. Human government, Tower of Babel. See, the ideas of human government began there. Not just human government, but also religious ideas. What, what we see as in religious iconoclasts, iconic, you know, symbolisms like the cross, uh, or the star in the moon with the Muslims or the five star. All of these, they come from here. They come from the top. I got a book. If you can, if you can find it, if it's still in publication. Uh, come on, I know you're in here. Aha. This is it. This is it right here. This is called the Two Babylons. Right here, the two, the, the two Babylons, or, uh, or the papal worship, proved to be the worship of Nimrod and his wife by Reverend Alexander Hislop. I'll, I'll let you look at this so you can get back up down, you can find it. Yeah, that's a, that's a great book to get. <clears throat> All right, Roman Catholic Church don't like that book. No. <laughs> but in it, it goes into great detail about where all these different um, symbolisms, you know, for religion, it comes from there. It even, it even tells you in that book that Nimrod, you know, who, who, was, who was the ruler of, of, uh, of the Tower of Babel and, and Nineveh, because that was the city he built, he was a black man. Uh, oh, says so in this book. If I could find it, I think, what was it at? Uh, I hope I didn't lose it. Ah, okay. Uh, I do have it. Because I marked it. Uh, somebody want to read this? Okay. Uh, let me see. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> this down at the bottom, where I got it marked below that, to start below that. And tell, tell them what page you are. This is the top, this is the two Babylons. What page you want? Page 34. Page 34 in the book of, of, of the two Babylons. Now Nimrod, as the son of Cush, was black, in other words, was a Negro. <laughs> <laughs> he was a Negro! <laughs> Can the Ethiopian change his skin? Is in the original. Can the Cushite do so? Keeping this then in mind, it was it will be seen that in that figure disentombed from Nineveh, we have both the prototype of the Angelus 
and Anglo-Saxon, Zer Nebogus, the seeds of the prophet Cush, and the real original of the black adversary of mankind. The black adversary. See, and you wonder why people, you know, <laughs> it makes you wonder like why people cut copper black folks during the 1500s, you know, because people had that, that feeling, you know, like you know, like especially when Obama became president, they, people, it's like the underlying thing, it's like, wait a minute, it's Neymar, because some people said that. You know, I said, Nimrod has come back. I was like, oh my, we're in trouble. He's the Antichrist, you know, that kind of thing. See, I'm, I'm showing you where they get the reference from. This is an old book. See, and, it's, and this part, and this is in Protestant Christianity too, in some parts, you know, that you read. But Dr. Kinley was a purveyor of rare books and stuff. What I understand between he and Dr. Carl Gross, they had a truckload of books. You know, that they had for references. And it would have to be that way. Because if Dr. Kinley received this great panoramic vision, all right, of, of showing how this creation, you know, what it is, how the purpose is, according to a, a divine pattern, then he would have to have a little knowledge of what the people don't know or don't understand or what they believe so that he could contrast and say, well, look, you know, this is what you say, but this is what the pattern says. Right. Or you can say, well, hey, well, you know something? Even in your literature, it says this, that just like what we say, and why, then why don't you believe it then? See, that kind of thing. All right? That's, that's good enough from there. Just to show you that, you know, yeah. <clears throat> See, this is where it started, the Tower of Babel. This is the first Babylonian Empire. Okay? Now here we got the second Babylonian Empire. See, that started with Nebuchadnezzar. Let's get that in there. Uh, Daniel, second chapter. Maybe th around 31, I think. See, I, I know I'm kind of compressing this, but I do want to get to some. I want to get down. I want to get down here to England and out to America. That's what I really want to do because I kind of got in, into that last week. Plus, what the first speaker talked about as far as the uh, the apostolic fathers, you know, how that got set up. All right. You want uh, Daniel? Daniel 2 and 31. What does this say? Thou, O King. That's it. Hold it right there. While I, uh, I think he's looking for the, the other plate. I think it's plate 23. Or 20, yeah, 23, 25, somewhere around there. It's the, the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. That's what I want. Should be Abraham 24, 20. it should be 25, I think. No, it's not. No, then 24, 23. Anyway, history. Yeah, history, that's what I want. It's the history. That's it. What number is that? 26. 26? Well, I was close. <laughs> Uh, okay, big boy, I need your help again. Get your clamp. Yeah, I want this even with this, with the guy here. Okay, that's, that's cool. Thank you. All right. Okay, now we got this up here. This is Nebuchadnezzar's dream as compared to the God here. Look, I will be like the Most High. Okay, now you may read. Thou, O King, sawest, and behold, a great image. Mm -hmm. This great image whose brightness was ex excellent. Okay, now see, he's going through this dream, see. And let me preface it by saying this. When Nebuchadnezzar dreamed a dream, it was so terrible, it got to the point, he couldn't even remember the dream. So he told his people, you know, his uh, psychic friends network, he said, you know, y'all need to explain to me this dream. And, and they said, sure, okay, just tell us what the dream is. And he says, I can't remember it. So you need to tell me what I dreamed as well as what the meaning of the dream is. And they're like, well, man, who can do that, sir? Well, if you don't do that, I'm going to kill all you and your family, and your houses will be a dumb people. 
right? And so they're just panicking. So Daniel, who was in the, in the palace, he found got word of it, and they said, you know, well, this is, you know, Jeremy, but the king's going to kill us. He's going to kill us off because we can't explain this dream that he had. We don't even know what he had. And so Daniel entreated Yahweh, and Yahweh showed him. And so now Daniel is standing in front of the great and awesome Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, literally king of the world, okay? And he's standing there, and some, you know, never know, he's up on, he's always strong, and I am Daniel's looking, you know, well, thou, O king. So, and see, and look, Nebuchadnezzar could not remember what the dream is. As Daniel is speaking to him, the Holy Spirit in Daniel is bringing back to his remembrance, Nebuchadnezzar, what he dreamed, and the explanation of it. Okay? Now you may continue. This great image, whose brightness was excellent stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image heard was a fine gold. Mm -hmm. His breast, I mean, this image head was fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs brass, his legs of iron, his feet of iron and part, and part clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut up without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. Then was the iron and the clay and brass, the silver and the gold, broken to pieces together. And because of the chaff of the summer threshing floor, the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. Okay, now hold on for a minute. Just hold it. Now, look here. Here's Nebuchadnezzar, and he's in a dream. Let's just look at this just by the pattern. Nebuchadnezzar is asleep. That's a type of death. He is immersed in a dream. That's a burial. Now he is elevated in the spirit See to see this. All right? Okay, that's just showing you just on a basic level. He is dead now. Death, burial, I don't want to say resurrection, but elevation in the spirit. Okay? Continue reading. That no place was found for them. Mm -hmm. And that the stone, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain mm -hmm. and filled the whole earth. Mm -hmm. This is the dream. Mm -hmm. And we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Now, first he had to tell the king what the dream was. Why? He forgot. So as Daniel tells it to him, the Holy Spirit is bringing back to Nebuchadnezzar's remembrance what this dream was. Now Daniel is going to give him the interpretation of the dream. Go ahead. Thou, O king, art a king of kings. Mm -hmm. For the Eloah of heaven has given thee a kingdom of a kingdom power mm -hmm. and strength and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beast of the field and the fall of the heavens have he given unto thy hand, mm -hmm. and hath made thee ruler over all. Thou art his head of gold. Yeah, so you are that head of gold. See, Nebi, that's, that's who you are. Go ahead. And after thee shall rise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. Mm -hmm. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces, and subdue all things, and as iron that breaketh all things, shall it, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And there, whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, mm -hmm. and as the toes and of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. And at whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, and they shall not cleave to one another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings 
shall be the aloha of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people but it shall break in pieces and consume all the kingdoms and it shall stand forever okay see now that's what that's talking about see and look come over here see we said human government see Satan said I will be like the most high this is human government compare this to this which almost and if you didn't know any better you would think this was this and this is what human government tries to imitate wisdom intelligence knowledge love beauty justice foundation power strength Human government exhibits those qualities too. Human government, I don't give a damn what government, whether it's the American government, Chinese government, Russian, you know, some little Tonga, whatever, you know. You know, all governments do this. They try to exhibit, well, we're, we have wisdom, we have intelligence, we have knowledge, we have beauty, we have love, we have just, remember the Olympics? They had them out there with the flags, you know, showing them, you know, yes, this is who we are, this is our flag, this is our banner, this is what, you know. They, they show that foundation, power, strength. They show the same thing. They want you to do that. The Pledge of Allegiance comes from Nebuchadnezzar. You can read with the second chapter, but if you read in the third chapter, you read about how Nebuchadnezzar, he got corrupted and built a, a, a 90 foot st gold statue of himself and had the people worship it. And it said, when you hear the music, you need to give obedience. Wherever you at, you need to get on your knees and, and give obedience to that. Oh, what do you mean, the music? That's the national anthem. That's why when the national anthem is played, everybody gets up, put their hand on their heart, or if you're in the military, you know, yeah. you're giving obedience. Where that, I'm telling you, that came from Nebuchadnezzar. That's how, that, that's how all that got started. Human, all that is incorporated and passed down through history. Because when you really understand it, the history of Western civilization, the road to this is, part of this road is this idol. See, from Babylon, from Mystery Babylon, from Nebuchadnezzar, then you had the Medes and the Persians. See, that was Cyrus, the great. See, the three people we, you know, there were more Persian kings, but the ones we deal with in the scriptures is Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes. Why? So Cyrus, because if you remember, Nebuchadnezzar was the one that took the Hebrews into captivity in 604. And in 601, well, actually it was 601 BBY, which is the beginning of the times of the Gentiles. All right? And they, uh, that was, see, that's, that's, that's another lecture in itself, because I, I mentioned the judges. See, the judges, the period of the judges, see, there, was, there were seven servitudes, six servitudes under the judges. The seventh servitude came when Nebuchadnezzar conquered them, and they were in servitude for three years. And then, in 601, he took them into Babylon. Daniel was the one of the first ones. It was three incursions, actually. 601, 597, and 586. Daniel was in the first one. And they took all the good people. The, the, the poor people, you know, they said, well, we don't need you. You can just go get a broom and police the area or something, you know. <laughs> you, know you, you know, go dress the vines or something, you know. Yeah, you know, that kind of thing. You know, they, they took the cream of the crop. You know, the aristocrats, the artisans, you know, all the skilled people, the royal people, they took them, you know, to Babylon. You know, the rest of y'all, no, no, we don't need you, man. Just go on and sweep up or something, you know. Keep it, you know. <laughs> okay, but that's how that happened, see. And it was Cyrus the Great. They were, they were in bondage for 70 years, and Cyrus the Great, the Persian, released them. All right, and allowed them to go back to the land and even to rebuild the temple because it was Nebuchadnezzar that destroyed Solomon's temple in his third reign. He destroyed the temple and the wall of Jerusalem. See, as I said, it was Cyrus who released them and gave them permission to rebuild the temple. Darius was the one who reconfirmed the order because somebody questioned it. Right. Artaxerxes was the one who gave Nehemiah the commandment to go and rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. Okay, that was in 457. BBY. See, all these things are, you know, pertinent and, and connected once you get the information and uh, learn how to put it together to make some kind of cohesive sense. Okay? The Medes and the Persians lasted until the Greeks, city-states, came along, particularly Alexander the Great. See, he came along and conquered the Persians and conquered the rest of the world, too, for that matter. 
See, Alexander was, he was, yeah, he, he, he was a young guy, he was like in his 30s, and he conquered the world. You know, a lot of people don't realize it, but you know, but he was, but he was, he was gay. <laughs> he was a gay conqueror. You know, people, you know, people when they had stereotypes about gay, but, but not Alexander. Alexander was, he was a conqueror. He conquered, I mean, you know what I'm saying? And so, and, he, and, and because of that, he had no heir. So his empire was divided up amongst his four generals. Matter of fact, let's get that. So Daniel, the seventh chapter, uh, let's see if that's the King James, maybe it's the fifth chapter in the Holy Name. See, we have these beasts up here. See, we have, we talked about the image here, the gold, the silver, the brass, the iron, part iron, part clay. Now, what we're gonna read is a confirmation vision that Daniel received to verify, verify what Yahweh showed Nebuchadnezzar. What you got? Not the first verse? Yes. Says, In the first year of Belshazzar, yes. king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream. That's and, it. Go ahead. And visions of his head upon his bed. Mm -hmm. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Mm -hmm. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings therefore were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man. Okay, now that's this up here. That's, now see, that's Babylon. And that is correlated to this head of gold here that we talked about. See, that's, that's the same thing. See, what Daniel is receiving is a confirmation vision of what Nebuchadnezzar saw. So this lion here would be like this head of gold. Continue. And a man's heart was given to it. Mm -hmm. And behold, another beast, a second like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it, and they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. Okay, now that is Medes and the Persians. That's the arms of silver here. That's compared to that. Okay, continue. After this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the black of it four wings of a fowl. Mm -hmm. The beast had also four heads and dominion was given to it. I said, now that would be like the Greeks. As I said, Alexander conquered that earth, but when he died, he had no heir. So it was his four generals that took over. I can give you their names. Lysimachus, uh, Seleucus, see, Lysimachus, Seleucus, uh, Cassander, and Ptolemy. Ptolemy is probably the most famous of them all because Ptolemy is the, is the forefather of the famous Cleopatra. See, a lot of people don't realize that Cleopatra was a Greek. They say, well, she's black. No, she was not. She was descended from the Greeks. And, and, and let me tell you something about that. You know, because somebody will say, well, she had a little black in her. No, she didn't. Because Ptolemy, who was a Greek soldier when he took over Egypt, he continued on with the Egyptian religion, which is the practice of brother-sister marriage. He married his sister. I'm talking about Ptolemy, married his sister and had children, and they in turn married each other. Cleopatra is the product of maybe six, maybe seven generations of ancestral marriages. See? And then black folks want to claim her, man. I'm like, uh -uh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a little research goes a long way, boy. You know, but but my point is, I'm not diminishing her. She was a very smart lady, very clever. She was, she was the, see, the Greek empires eventually were all conquered by pagan Rome. Her kingdom, Ptolemaic Egypt, was the last of the Greek empires to be conquered. That happened in a very famous battle. It's a very famous naval battle. You can go look it up. I'll put it on the board for you. <clears throat> it's a very famous naval battle that ended the, the Cleopatra's kingdom. This was called the Battle of Actium. This is where the forces 
of Octavian Caesar, who was the grandnephew of Julius Caesar, and his general, Marcus Vicinius Agrippa. They conquered the forces of Cleopatra and Mark Anthony. And that was the last battle of Cleopatra. And that's when they were on the run, and she went back to Egypt, and that's when she committed suicide with the, with the snake. But, the, but once her kingdom fell, that was the last of the Greek kingdoms, and Rome took over the Mediterranean world. But this was, you can look this up, this is in the history books, the Battle of Actium. You know, very famous battle, naval battle too, man. This, this fits. Okay, uh, where, where are we at? Number seven, after this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth, it devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, mm -hmm. and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of men, mm -hmm. and a mouth speaking great things. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, mm -hmm. whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like a pure wool. Mm -hmm. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. Mm -hmm. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Mm -hmm. Thou thousands, thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. Okay. Now that would be see that's compared to that rock that we read in the you know, the Elohim. See it's it's just correlating this with this and the destruction that's going to happen to this is the same destruction that's going to happen to these, the rock and the ancient of days. That's why we have here, kingdom of Satan abolished, kingdom of Yahshua restored. See, okay? What do you mean? That means, see, from, see, from the, see look, this was the degeneration in the first Adam that brought about Satan's kingdom in the first place. That's why we had this, maybe the serpent here, maybe we should read that. Uh, Genesis third chapter, maybe around 15 or somewhere. It says, I will put enmity between thee and thee and the woman. Uh-huh, go ahead. And between thy seed and her seed, mm -hmm. he shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said, No, go, go back up to 14. I need the serpent in, in okay. this. What, what happens to the serpent? And Yahweh Elohim said unto the serpent, mm -hmm. because, thou hast, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shall thou go, mm -hmm. and there shall thou eat of all the days of thy life. All right, thus shall thou eat all the days of thy life. Incarnated in the flesh, because we're, we're from the dust of the earth. So he's got to incarnate in the, this is the serpent. We got him drawn out here, and then we got him, and here he is coming down through history. That serpent, see. See, if, if Moses talked about a serpent, see, in Isaiah 8 and 20 says, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, then there's no light in them. Then we have to go back into Moses, which is what we did to draw out the serpent. Now we go to the prophecy and see what they may have to say about it. Isaiah 27 and 1. <clears throat> Isaiah 27 and 1. In the day Yahweh with his sword and great and strong sword mm -hmm. shall punish Leviathan. Shall punish Leviathan. What is a Leviathan? This is Leviathan. See, a great sea monster. Go ahead. The piercing serpent. The piercing serpent. See, we got it in the piercing serpent. Why? Because it was, why is Isaiah talking about a serpent? Because he's drawing out from what Moses wrote. 
Moses wrote about a serpent, so Isaiah's got to write something about this serpent. Continue. Even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, mm -hmm. and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. He's in the sea. What sea? The Atlantic Ocean? The Pacific? No. In the sea of men. Incarnated in the sea of men. And we're like, what, eight, 8 billion folks plus at this point? Incarnated in the sea of men. Continue. In that day, sing ye unto her a vineyard of red wine. A vineyard of red wine. What are you talking about? Did we read that in the scripture? It's about, about, about the woman drinking the blood of the martyrs. The, and blood is red, I think. You know, red wine, the blood, drinking the blood of the martyrs. See? Read. I, Yahweh, do keep it. I, Yahweh, will keep it. In other words, I, Yahweh, control this mystery of iniquity. Read. I will water it. I will water it. I will water this. You know, these, these kingdoms. What are you talking about? Look, back here, when you read the story of the Israelites down here in Egypt, when Moses and Aaron went down here, Yahweh told Moses, look, you're going to do these signs to him, but look, I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. He ain't going to listen to it. And look, he poured out ten devastating plagues. Let me tell you something. The first plague was the Nile River turning to blood. Do you know the Nile River is the longest river on the planet, exceeding like 4,000 miles, and Yahweh turned that whole river to blood. Had I been Pharaoh, I would have said, that's enough. Hey, y'all want to get it? Go, get out of here. Get, get the, go, you know, that would have been enough right there for me. You would have turned the, the, longest, the longest river on the planet, and you would have turned it to blood. <clears throat> you know, you would have turned it to blood, and you would have said, no, nah, I ain't going to let them go. That, you know that, but don't, that wasn't no normal man. That was Yahweh heart in his heart, man. You see something that, on a grand scale like that? Come on. And then you got nine other plagues. And listen, let me tell you something about these plagues. The Nile River was a goddess. Don't you think they were praying to the Nile River goddess, please come back, and she didn't? Right. <laughs> or all these other you know, plagues that happened, you know, like on the, on the cattle and stuff. Apis was a, was a god, the bull god. You know, oh, Apis, please cure the cattle, and he didn't. <laughs> or like with stingy darkness down here. Don't you think they prayed to... Son, Ron, please come back, bring your light. And he didn't. That was Yahweh conquering the gods of Egypt. Letting them know, look, look I'm the one running the show here. Not, and even Pharaoh was a god. Because, see, his son, that was the last play, was killed. And so Pharaoh couldn't do nothing about that. Death angel went over there and killed his son. Firstborn of man, be that includes Pharaoh's son. He was a god. He had killed the son of a god. Well, raise him back up, Pharaoh, you a god. Couldn't do nothing. Then after that, after, after Egypt saw all the ten devastating plagues, they just said, man, just get, go, get out, just leave. And they, and they looted, they looted the treasure cities there, Pithom and Ramsey, because part of that was used to build this tabernacle. And that's another story. But where are you at? Lest any hurt it, mm -hmm. I will keep it night and day. I'll keep it night and day, man. In other words, these kingdoms, I'm, I'm going to water these kings and let them grow and become as big and as powerful as you want, and then I'm going to knock them down. <laughs> Read. Theory is not in me. Mm -hmm. Who would set the, bear, the briars and horns That's good and enough. Horns. That's good enough. That's all I need. Go to Revelations, the 13th chapter. As we said, these, these animals that Daniel saw is a confirmation of what Nebuchadnezzar saw here. Now, John on the Isle of Patmos, he's looking back, and he's going to confirm, because see, look, John here, he's like two bookends. John, see, what Moses had to say, the prophets have to draw out of. Yahshua's coming along, he's fulfilling the law and the prophets. John here is going to confirm not only what Moses is saying, but what the prophets are saying and what Yahshua is fulfilling. Okay? So now here's John on the Isle of Patmos looking back. Read. And I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. And I said he saw a beast rise up out of the sea. What sea? The sea of men. That is to say, these empires. Read. Having seven heads uh -huh. and ten horns. Seven heads and ten horns. Read. And upon his horns ten crowns. Uh -huh. And upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Mm -hmm. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. It was like unto a leopard. Didn't we read that in Daniel? Right. Yes. See, read. 
and his feet were as the feet of a bear. Then we read that in Daniel, see the feet of a bear, read. And his mouth as the mouth of a lion. As the mouth of a lion, then we read that. See, John is confirming what Daniel wrote about this beast. Okay, go ahead. And the dragon gave him his power mm -hmm. and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death. Now I say saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death. How did that happen? Remember, we talked about the stone cut out of the mountains without a hand with, with Nebuchadnezzar's image. With these beasts, we talked about, it talked about the Ancient of Days. See, and it wounded this beast. Kingdom of Satan, about kingdom of Yahshua. This is Yahshua's death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That was the wounding of the beast. Because Yahshua came in during the time of pagan Rome. And he wounded that beast. Read. But according to a purpose. Because see, and also, you can read it in Daniel. See, that how Satan, time was given to him to operate in this age according to the purpose. That's another lecture in itself we'll get into when we talk about time and the ages and the 490 cycles and things like that. All right? But keep, keep on that. And his deadly wound was healed. And now his deadly wound was healed. What do you mean? See, if we went through this once before. History is a threefold process. History is threefold. You have ancient history. Ancient history started with Adam. All right? And from Adam, it lasted, ancient history lasted until 470. Maybe I should draw it out. Okay. Let's see. I need a, I need a darker one here. Okay, this is the tabernacle. It's the court roundabout, the gate, the door. I don't, I'm not putting any vessels in because I'm just using some chronology. Here's ancient, ancient history, <clears throat> which is from, which is from Adam to 476 A.D. Why that date? Because that's the fall of the Roman Empire. Okay? And look, it's a long period. That's more than 4,000 years. Why? Because from the gate to the door is a long walk. <laughs> Get it? It's a long walk. Here in the holy place, we have, uh, we'll say, medieval. Medieval. Or you can, or, or, we'll sometimes they'll say, Middle Ages, the Middle Ages, all right? Now this period began at the end of the, the fall of the Roman Empire, but they, but usually scholars will put it like this. They'll say from here, they'll say 500 AD to 1500 AD. Why? Because this is around the time the Renaissance begins, the Reformation by Martin Luther. This is a thousand year period, the Middle Ages. The church, you know, this is where you had all those castles, and the church, you know, the Holy Roman Empire, they had a big sway during this time period. Then in the 1500s, that's the beginning of the modern era, so-called, because Christopher Columbus so-called discovered America. And, you know, in, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. <laughs> <laughs> they used to teach me that in kindergarten, believe it or not. <clears throat> and that was the beginning of the modern era. That was the beginning of the global economy because from there you had the slave trade. You had the Atlantic trade, the triangular slave trade. From you know, from from, from Europe, they would go, you know, they would go to America and then from there to get the slaves. They bring the slaves to America, trade for, you know, 
raw goods, take it to England, make good products, and then they would go to Africa and sell them these products to the, to the slavers, to the black folks there, products and stuff, and guns and things, and then it was just, that was the global economy. That was the beginning of the modern global economy, 1500. In other words, the modern era. The modern era which started around, let's see, 1500 AD to the present. So really, the modern era is only like a little over 500 years. And check this out. In the most holy place, you got the Ark of the Covenant, right? Because the high priest would go in there on the Day of Atonement and do the flicker and see the flash of the Shekinah. What is the modern era punctuated with? Electricity. <laughs> the light bulb. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? All of this stuff is correlated if you know what you're doing with this, see? And look, this is a long walk from here to there. This is a, the holy place is a bigger compartment than the most holy place. See, that's why it's... So, here we got a small compartment. That ought to let you know the modern era is not going to last longer than, than this one. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? See, all these things are correlated. See, if you take the time and look at this stuff, okay? Uh, where are we at in the book? And all the world wondered at the beast. Now, all the whole world wondered at the beast. This is what I'm saying. See, Constantine, right. see, Constantine, oh boy. If you got this down, I hope you got this. Got all this down? Okay, good, I'm gonna erase. See, Constantine, he was the one who um, converted the Roman Empire to Christianity. And this is what happened. Uh, this is a very famous, this is what you can, this is called the Battle of This is called the Battle of Milvian Bridge. You can look this up, okay? And, this, and, and Constantine was, was fighting for supremacy of the Roman Empire. So the night before the battle, he received a, a strong delusion from Yahweh Elohim. He was shown in this vision. This is, the, this is the sun. He saw a vision of the sun, and he saw a symbol beneath the sun. It looked something like this. And then he saw some words in Latin, which because that's what it was. He saw these words. In hot signal this is. That's Latin for in this sign conquer. And he saw this symbol and he told his men to put this symbol on their shields and, and they would win the day. In which they did. Now, if you deconstruct this symbol, these are two Greek letters put together. The S would equal out to CH in English. The P looking letter would equal out to an R. So it would stand for CHR, which is representative of Christ. Okay? This same symbol here, if you look at the Vatican, see, they have the same symbol. See, except that what they did, they put circles here, circles here, and made a key. The keys, that's the symbol of the Vatican. Where did they get it from? They got it from Constantine. This was what he, this is how the beast was healed. Pagan Rome gave its power and authority to papal Rome. That's why Dr. Kinley, on this chart here, look here. That's why on this chart here, see, he put the dragon here representing papal Rome, and then he got the leopard here, representing papal Rome. Now on the 40 plate chart, the guy that sits here is a man named Herod Agrippa. He was king over the Israelites. How did he become king? He became king because the Romans made him king. See, in other words, the, the Roman pagan Rome gave his power to Herod, who, who depicted himself as a god, as someone to be worshipped. And Yahweh had to slap him down. You can read that in Acts, uh, let's say, I think it's a 12th chapter somewhere. You can read that. But that's the example Dr. Kinley used to show that back here, to show here pagan Rome giving its power. See, in other words, this was, 
This, this beast was wounded by the stone, but how was it healed? Pagan Rome gave its power and authority to papal Rome. And that's what grew the church through the Middle Ages. They ruled, see, until the Reformation, when Martin Luther came along and, and, and uh, nailed his 95 Thesis of Against the Cross, okay? Now, uh, keep reading quickly because I know I'm running out of time. They worshiped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. Uh -huh. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like unto the beast? Mm -hmm. Who is able to make war with him? Read. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things mm -hmm. and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. 40 and two months, which is uh, 1260 days or years. Continue. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against Yahweh mm -hmm. to blaspheme, blaspheme his name mm -hmm. and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Good enough. Let's see. Uh, go to the scripture lesson. See that well enough? Yeah. You, you just you just zoom out a little bit. That way you get both me and the thing. <laughs> Seventeen and uh, four. Maybe let's try to start there quickly. Seventeen and four. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color. Purple and scarlet. Co Isn't that what's on the tabernacle pattern we told? He. This was on the veil. The anointed chair that covered, and I set you that way. Read. And decked with gold and precious stones uh -huh. and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, mm -hmm. full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Read. And upon her forehead was a name written, mm -hmm. Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots mm -hmm. and abominations of the earth. Read. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the sons mm -hmm. and with the blood of the martyrs of Yahshua. In other words, there's been persecution from <laughs> from, 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 from up here. It's always been that way. Those who, you know, preach that you're persecuted by the adversary. Quickly read. And when I saw her, I wondered with great astonishment. Mm -hmm. And the angel said unto me, mm -hmm. Wherefore art thou astonished? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, mm -hmm. which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The seven heads and ten horns, read. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the abyss, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose name were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they behold the beast that was mm -hmm. and is not and yet is. No, that's okay. I'll, I'll just hold it. I'll and here <laughs> is the mind which hath wisdom, the seven heads right. and seven mountains. All right, the seven heads are seven mountains. A mountain in typology represents a kingdom. Right. All right. Now, mind you, I know that there in Rome there are seven hills on Rome, which the Vatican said that's. And that was always taught that to me, which I had no complaint against. However, John is looking at this thing from a from a more lengthy process by seeing the thing coming all the way down, these different kingdoms and stuff. Okay, but go ahead. On which the woman sitteth. Uh-huh. And there are seven kingdoms. There are seven kingdoms. Mm -hmm. Five are fallen. Now see in eighty ninety six, there are seven kingdoms. Five are fallen. In eighty ninety six, the city of Enoch is gone, the Tower of Babel is gone, Babylon is gone. Medes and Persians are gone. The Greeks are gone. See, five are fallen in 1896 because John is, is receiving this vision in 1896. So these five kingdoms are gone. Read. And one is. Now the one is, is Rome. Pagan Rome. That's how John got to the Isle of Patmos in the first place. It was a prison. It wasn't Paradise Island for him. It was a prison. He was, he was sent there by the Roman government. I believe the, the emperor at the time may have been the Roman Emperor Trajan that sent John onto the Isle of Patmos. So one is, in AD 96, pagan Rome still exists, read. The other is not yet come. Now the papacy in AD 96 had not yet come. See, and we told you when it will come, it was through Constantine. It will come, but in AD 96 it hadn't come yet, but read. 
And when it cometh, it must continue a short space. Now, when it do come, it has to continue a short space. And it did until 1960. And in 1961, Dr. Kelly published his book. See, so it did continue a, a, quite a short space. All right, continue. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth head. Now, since 1960, and since the publication of Dr. Kelly's textbook, see, which, which exposed this, see, since then, we have been living in the eighth satanic kingdom. What does that mean? That means it is a conglomeration of the previous seven. All the elements of the major elements and accomplishments in these previous kingdoms, you see them being manifested now today. It is a conglomeration of everything. All right, continue. And is of the seven and mm. goeth into perdition. And it's this now, it, it, now, what we're living in now is of the seven, and, it, and it's the state that will go into perdition or destruction. Continue. And the ten horns which thou sawest mm -hmm. are ten kings. Now see, these are the ten horns that see that prop up these ten kings. Why? Remember, on Nebuchadnezzar's image, you have ten toes there. <laughs> From a natural standpoint, your ten toes prop you up. If you didn't have any toes, you couldn't walk. See, it's what props you up. These are the kingdoms that prop this up, Reeve. Which have received no kingdom mm -hmm. as yet. As of yet in 1896, but they will in 1960 because the way the laws are made. See, read. But receive power as kings one hour with the beast. One hour is 40 years. When did that one hour begin? 1960. One hour with the beast. Read. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Uh huh. These shall make war with the Lamb. And the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is the mighty ruler of kings, mm -hmm. and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he saith unto them, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore mm -hmm. sitteth mm -hmm. on peoples, mm -hmm. and multitudes, and nations, and tongues, and the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore. Now see, these going to hate the whore. They'll work with it, but they're going to hate them. Because Joshua said this, Satan's kingdom is divided against itself. The, there are many divisions in Satan's kingdom, but the biggest division is between the Roman Catholicism and communism. See, we, we, we'll touch on that in another lecture. But that's the great, which is what's happening now with Putin or Kekagri the Ukraine. He's a, he wants to restore the former Soviet Union. And Joe Biden, who's a Roman Catholic, he got put in there to withstand that. He's the great Christian knight of Western civilization to stand up against Putin and the communists. Not just Putin, but the Chinese too. And whoever the communists, because those are the two great forces. That's the iron and the clay that won't mix. The two ideologies that will adhere to men but they will not adhere to each other. A communist and a Roman Catholic cannot get along. Right. Why? Because the Roman Catholic's allegiance is to the Pope, whereas a communist's allegiance is to himself because the communists are atheists. And man is at the center of their universe, whereas with the Roman Catholics, well, a man is too, the Pope. But see, but, but these two systems can't, they can't coexist. It's impossible. They can't. So therefore, Satan's kingdom is divided against itself. And the only, and Dr. Kennedy said in his textbook, the only outcome is, is a great catastrophe. That's what he said, but quickly read. And shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. Mm -hmm. For Yahweh hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, mm -hmm. and to agree, mm -hmm. and give their kingdom unto the beast. Okay, now see, these, 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 these are the ten horns. See, look, these are the various aspects of society. Agriculture, medical, mercantile, that's the money, entertainment, sports, movies, theater, science, technology, education, religions, the media, heavy industries or manufacturing, transportation, military, political. These are the kingdoms. These are the ten toes that prop up society. And you have kings and queens in all these things, the corporations. They're the kings of these, they're the kings. And they are persons. See, according to the Supreme Court, that they are persons. You know, corporate, the word corporation, corporate, the root word is corpus, which means body. All right, turn to, uh, let's see, I think it's the next chapter, 18, maybe around 10. Standing afar off for. What does, what does 9 say? And the kings of the earth mm. who have committed fornication 
and lived deliciously with her, shall bewail her and lament her mm -hmm. for her. When they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, mm -hmm. the great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. Mm -hmm. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. Mm -hmm. The merchandise of gold. Now she's going to read off the list. And look, everything she says, she's going to read. You can find a category for it over here somewhere. Read. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all thine wood, wood and all manner vessels of ivory and all manner vessels of precious wood and of brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beast and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men. Oh, that's on there too, see, religion, souls of men. You're a commodity, you didn't know that? You're a commodity to be bought, sold, bartered for, traded for. To the devil, everything's a commodity, see? And this is what he deals with, see? You know, and all of these things, you know, that this is how the world is ran. Okay, give you some rest, Daryl. <laughs> this is how the world is ran. Mm -hmm. See, by that, see, and, he's, and, and, and I wanted to get it to England, see. I may have to get it to it next time, but I said that last week, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> but England, see, is a continuation. Actually, England was part of the Roman Empire. It was the furthermost extent of the Roman Empire. It made it as far as Scotland, where Emperor Hadrian built a wall up here. You know, a lot of people don't know that wall was built by black Roman soldiers. They found evidence of that recently. You know, oh yeah, the, the Rome, see, here's, here's the thing about Rome. There was no shame to that game. You could be a citizen of Rome. They said, you, you could be hanging with us, we'll let you be a citizen. And they didn't care what it was, you know, whether you were black, white, whatever, you know, you'd be a citizen. A lot of people don't realize this. There, there have been a couple of black Caesars. A lot of people don't realize that. What was his name? Septimus, Sep, Septimus Severus. He was from North Africa. He was a black man who was emperor of the Roman Empire and his son, Caracalla. People don't believe it. Oh, that, there were three popes, for that matter, that were black. Right. You know, one of them was Leo Africanus. Why would a white guy name himself African Lion in Latin? <laughs> so, I mean, it's a lot of things, and, and see, and, 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 and England here, see, drew from, see, England, and see, Henry VIII divorced himself from the Roman Catholic Church, and in time, you know, became the Anglican, Anglican Church of England, and, um, and during this time, after it was not long, you know, a little while after, to his daughter, you had the Great Enlightenment, where people had revolutionary ideas about government, and, um, and economics, like John Smith, who wrote the, the, the book on economics, or uh, John Locke, who came up with the ideas of government, which right. the founding fathers of this country, country took upon. They were deists, and they took upon his ideas of government. America did. And the Americans, George Washington and all that, they drew from the Romans and the Greeks the idea of a republic and a democracy. See? They got it, they do it from these people, see? So this ought to tell you, and look, this, this fell. If they're gonna fail, then, then America, if you're drawing the ideas from these people and they fail, then you're gonna fall too, <laughs> see? But here's the thing that, that as, as we just read, we're in the eighth satanic kingdom, which is a conglomeration of everything. So I have no idea how this beast is going. It's going to be a hideous looking beast, you know. It's like Frankenstein's monster. You remember Frankenstein? Uh, the, the Dr. Frankenstein, he went and got, you know, he went to the graveyard and got this body part, that body part, this other body part, this other body part, put it, it together, hit it with some electricity and start going, it's alive, it's alive, oh my God, it's alive, it's alive, you know. And that's really what the world is. It's just different parts, you know. All these different things are trying to incorporate this, that, and the other. 
You know, there are some folks that don't want to do that, some folks that do. And see, and it's all satanic because it's all, it's all divided against itself. See, but the thing is, when it comes to us, those who believe in the true gospel, those two forces that may not like each other, they say, oh, hold, hold it for a minute. Let's just cease our, our you know, you know, entanglement. See, there, there's some Yasha ones over there, man. We need to get rid of them. We need to deal with them because they know the truth. See, see, that's the thing that I worry about. See, you know, because they say, oh, well, you ain't going to do nothing. But see, Satan, look, Satan knew who Yashua was. You can read in the eighth chapter of Matthew, you know, where he came out of the, these demons, you know, they said, we, what have you to do with us, Yahshua? You know, if you come before the time, you know, 20 minutes before the time, see, they knew. They know. They're not stupid. So they do what they can, everything they can. But Yahweh has thrown a monkey wrench in the thing, see. He gave, he threw a pandemic out here and, and two years ago, and that just disrupted the whole world. People are talking about, oh, it's inflation, everything is Biden's fault. No, it's not. It's Yahweh's fault. He did that. And, you know, and, and look, the gas prices ain't just high here, it's worldwide. Inflation ain't just happening here, it's worldwide. And I can tell you that, you know, and they're, they're, they're struggling just like we are. Probably in some cases worse. You know, because the United States is a big country and it can draw on, you know, resources from 50 states. But even then, you know, it's connected to a global economy now. Everything, I mean, I could sneeze here and somebody in China will catch a cold. Right. That's just how interconnected we are. I mean, we can get on a phone and talk to somebody across timelines, you know, on the other side of the world. I remember the first time they did that when they put a satellite, it was at the Telstar back in the 60s, and they, and they showed the Olympics from China. But you had to get up like 4.30 in the morning to watch it live like that, but that was the first time they did something like that. See, so the whole world is interconnected. And see, look, if it was one city back here that, that ruled the world, then you have to see in principle that it's one city ruling the world now. That is to say this, the whole earth is now that one city, which is Babylon. Where we at, you know, these different countries, it's just like neighborhoods, you know? <laughs> really, at this point, you know, it's just a neighborhood, you know? Oh, well, that's a neighborhood over there, this neighborhood over here, you know? And everybody has their own concepts about how they think everything should run. But Dr. Kennedy said this, see, the human mind is subject to change. See, and it's only going to change in one or two directions, either for better or for worse. And, in, and really, and it doesn't matter. Somebody will like it and somebody, everybody's not going to like it or love it, you know. And that's the way human government is. It's subject to change. And it's going to change either for better or for worse. Somebody will say, oh, it's better. But, that's it. but another person that's standing next to you say, no, it's, it's for better, it's for worse. I don't like it. You know, and you're never going to satisfy nobody. However, in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah, let's read one more scripture and I'll be done. Philippians 3 and 20. And see, the kingdom of Yahshua is nothing like these kingdoms on earth. Though the kingdoms of earth try to imitate Yahshua the Messiah, but they just simply can't. Go ahead. Philippians 3 and 20. For our citizenship is in heaven. Now, that's our true citizenship, you know, not America or, or Europe or South America, or Africa, China. That's, you know, yeah, we, you know, I got a passport in my wallet. I got, I got an American passport, all right? So, yeah, I, I mean, you have to deal with this. But that's not our real citizenship. Right. See, just like these folks back here, they were down here and they had to, they sojourned here. That's right. Then they had to leave go through the wilderness and come up here. We're just sojourners here. Look, man, we're in the fourth day. We're just here. We're, the, we're just sojourners. We still got three more ages to go. See? Because our citizenship is in heaven, which is Yahshua the Messiah. Quickly read. From whence also we are expecting our Savior King, mm -hmm. Yahshua the Messiah, who shall change our vile body mm -hmm. that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. See, fashioned like to his glorious body. See, not this body, because see, we're already fashioned in the image of the earth or of the world. This is the image of the world that we have fashioned ourselves after. That has to be shattered so that it can be revealed who we truly are. Continue quickly. According to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things mm -hmm. unto himself. Uh-huh. Okay. See, that's, that's what we want, all right? 
right? I didn't get to where I wanted to be, but I hope that at least I gave a good overview. I hope, you know, so that we can get into some other things and other dates and other subjects and other times. But the thing we want, we simply ask you is take the time to re-research and rehearse the matter. You know, review the record that Dr. Kinley left, the record being these charts, his textbook, his pamphlets, his transcripts, the universe at large, and last but not least, the law of the prophets, which are the scriptures. Okay? Thank you very much for tuning in. We hope that you were edified by the things that were said. As always, be safe, be healthy, but most of all, be in Yahshua the Messiah. Why? Because he truly is your only hope of glory. And with those few words, hallelujah. charts made, okay? Uh, we do accept uh, donations, that's how we get these things going, and the place to rent and all that, and uh, hopefully one day we'll have a place we can hang these up permanently. Okay, uh, good to see Daryl here, his lady, uh, Joseph Iles, I don't know when he's going to be going back to Columbia, but he's here temporarily. And uh, thank you everybody for tuning in, and the soccer continues next week. Same channel, same station. Okay, uh, I asked uh, my beautiful daughter, Nanette, to come up and give the doxology. Okay, class, let us all stand to be dismissed. I'll be reading the doxology from the last two verses of Jude. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise Elohim, our Savior, the Yahshua, the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time, now and ever. Let us all say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.